The U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved 55 new drugs in 2023. In the same year, the European Medicines Agency recommended 77 new medicines for approval, and China's National Medicines and Pharmaceutical Administration approved 87. Between government funding and pharmaceutical industry spending, billions of dollars are spent annually to bring just a handful of drugs to market. That means some strategic investing is likely going on behind the scenes, and we were curious about the factors driving some of that strategy. Thanks in part to support from the NIHCM, that's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. At the risk of sounding obvious, the more money a potential drug is likely to make, the more money pharmaceutical companies are willing to invest in its development. Several factors are taken into account here, including estimated cost of developing the drug, likelihood of the drug making it to market, expected demand, price points in different markets, and policies that will affect supply and demand. The estimated median cost of developing a new drug in the United States is around $985 million, takes somewhere around a decade to fully develop, and only a small fraction of these drugs, like 12%, will actually make it to FDA approval. Those seem like pretty unattractive prospects, but if other factors are looking good, pharmaceutical company may be willing to jump on board for development. So what are those other factors? For one, the company will want to consider how in demand a drug might be. For example, drugs for rare diseases, often referred to as orphan drugs, aren't generally seen as a good investment from this point of view. That's because when a disease is rare, the demand for the drug will be low. This is why FDA approved drugs exist for only about 5% of rare diseases. This isn't great for people suffering from the seven to 10,000 known rare diseases, but the priorities of the drug consumer and the priorities of the drug investor aren't always, shall we say, perfectly aligned. But there are other factors involved that can help to even things out, like policy. Several government policies and programs influence the drug development landscape. For example, in the United States, Programs like Medicare can increase demand for prescription drugs by subsidizing drug costs. Government regulations on drug development that stipulate the ins and outs of the approval process, including things like the kind and amount of data required for approval, affect the supply of drugs by making the approval landscape more or less challenging. This can include different mechanisms whereby approval can be expedited under certain circumstances. In addition, when the government recommends new drugs to consumers like vaccines, that can affect both supply and demand by encouraging, or not, people to purchase them. Government investment in basic research also influences supply by funding the foundation of work that is necessary to support the drug's further development. When the taxpayer foots the bill to uncover the mechanism of a drug, the company may then be in a better position to take it from there to market. Because supply and demand are major economic determinants of successful drug development outcomes, the types of policies and programs in place make a big difference in terms of investor decision making. Other types of government policy include mechanisms like tax credits that defray development costs and incentivize drug companies to invest in more R&D. On the other hand, laws like the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act, which allows Medicare to negotiate drug prices, can potentially limit companies' profits on a new drug disincentivizing some research. Some view this as stifling of innovation. Some view it as a win for the consumer, and many land somewhere along that continuum. It's a complicated balance and one that can get controversial. Also controversial are government policies surrounding patent protections. These have a big impact on the potential profit to be made from a drug, and thus a big impact on research and development spending. When a company files a patent for a new drug in the United States, they are given exclusive rights to develop that drug and sell it at whatever price they want for a full 20 years. So if they file a patent and then spend 10 years getting the drug to market, they have an additional 10 years to sell the drug with zero competition. And then they can file secondary patents and all of that which we discussed in the last episode, please go watch it if you haven't yet, but it provides them the ability to make the patent last even longer by focusing on other attributes of the drug. And that's probably good for innovation, but costly to the consumer. Given that innovation is also important for consumers, there's another delicate balance to strike here. Government policies expediting review and approval of drugs serves as another incentive. When the FDA is willing to give priority review and expedited approval to orphan drugs, which is more likely than it is for other drugs, it has a positive impact on the number of orphan drugs eventually approved. Imagine that, which is encouraging for investors. 
Much of this can be summed up by push and pull incentives, two different types of strategies used to incentivize drug development. Push incentives are meant to lower drug development costs. These types of incentives come in the form of things like grants, public-private partnerships, and tax credits. Pull incentives are meant to boost financial gain after a drug has been developed. These types of incentives come in the form of things like easier regulatory processes, extended patents, and higher pricing. And to sum up the answer to our initial question about the major factors driving drug investment strategy, it all basically boils down to three things. How much money a drug is anticipated to make in the long run, how much it's going to cost to develop, and how existing or pending legislation will influence supply and demand. Simple, right? Well, like everything else in life, the closer you look, the more complexity you see. Drug development's complicated, and so are the factors that influence the end price to the consumer. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? You might enjoy the previous episode, which is the first episode in this series on prescription drug pricing. We'd also like it if you'd like the video down below. Subscribe to the channel. Maybe go on over to patreon.com slash healthcare triage, where you can help support the show to make it bigger and better. We'd like to especially thank our research associates, Joe Sevitz and Edward Lillaholm, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral, Sam.